Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Unlocking Capital for Climate Solutions, the Benefits of a National Climate Bank. I'm Dan Bursett, Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. EESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. More recently, we've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in providing on-bill financing programs for their customers. Whether for policymakers or the public, we do our best to provide informative, objective, nonpartisan coverage of climate change topics. Everything we do, briefings, fact sheets, issue briefs, articles, newsletters, even podcasts, is always available for free online. And the best way to keep track of our work and access our resources is to visit us online at www.esi.org and sign up for Climate Change Solutions and follow us on Twitter at EESI Online. As the debate over infrastructure continues to rage and sputter, while somehow also expanding and contracting with each news cycle, here we are today to talk about a national climate bank. Nobody knows where things will end up in Congress. There are positive and negative indicators, real and imagined, everywhere you look and in every article you read. If you want to be optimistic, you have your reasons and evidence to back up your claims. And the same goes if you want to be pessimistic. Truly, at least inside the Beltway, things have long at long last returned to normal. One thing we do know, climate change is an urgent threat. And to do something about it, we need to get started. Returning to the Paris Agreement and renewing our commitment to emissions reductions were great first steps back into taking climate change seriously. And the first budget proposal of the Biden-Harris administration was chock full of good ideas and smart investments that would marshal and harness an all of government approach to climate change. But we need Congress to act. We need new policies that ensure the US lives up to its international commitments we need to make sure critical programs are funded and aimed squarely at equitable and justice-oriented emissions reductions. And we need to really rethink U.S. national energy policy. On Friday, we hosted a briefing towards the energy system of tomorrow to start sketching out what energy system infrastructure needs to look like a decade into the future so we can understand where we need infrastructure investments now. It was the first of a three-part series, Modernizing the U.S. Energy System, Opportunities, Challenges, and the Path Forward. The second installment, Modernizing America's Transmission Network, is Friday at noon. To sign up and watch the archived webcasts uh, for Friday's session and to sign up for the upcoming sessions, visit us online at www.esi.org. Much needed upgrades in our energy system would facilitate significant emissions reductions, as we learned on Friday, by helping us tap renewable energy resources move energy from where it is generated to where it's needed more efficiently and make the most of new technologies to reduce our consumption and boost reliability and resilience. And another thing we could do in the context of infrastructure, if we want lots of emissions reductions, is to find a way to beat once and for all the boogeyman of clean energy upgrades, upfront costs. Sometimes upfront costs are just an excuse not to make an investment. And where this is the case, you can see the boogeyman's wicked sidekick, simple payback, lurking in the shadows, encouraging short-sighted decision-making, and whispering disparaging things about energy efficiency and rooftop solar panels into the ears of the unwitting. In many cases, though, upfront costs represent an actual barrier, especially for households and small businesses that lack access to affordable capital and bear a heavy burden of high monthly utility bills. Things are relatively easy if you have good credit, low debt, cash just sitting around waiting to be spent, in a network of qualified contractors to do the work. But it's much more challenging to consider solar and energy efficiency if the initial investments are out of reach, even if you end up saving money and enjoying more ownership over your energy decisions. That is where green banks come in. Green banks are neither inherently green nor typical banks, but these governmental, quasi-governmental, or nonprofit organizations can be extraordinarily effective when it comes to making affordable capital more accessible and equitable. Today, more than 20 green banks are operating across the US and providing targeted investments in rural areas, low and moderate income communities, and communities of color to advance equitable climate change solutions. These green banks use innovation and creativity to develop new ways to overcome upfront costs and help low cost financing reach those who need it most. And when that happens, when upfront costs, costs have been overcome, benefits start to flow emissions reductions from clean energy investments that were previously out of reach or unaffordable, opportunities for ownership and wealth creation in low and moderate income communities and communities of color, 
and jobs, jobs, and more jobs, and workforce development and training opportunities to put people to work. But green banks face a major constraint, resources. If only there were a national climate bank that could leverage the US Treasury to support state and local green bank efforts to reach more people and scale up cost-effective energy efficiency, renewable energy, beneficial electrification, energy storage, electric vehicle charging, and climate adaptation projects, if only. Well, there are proposals in Congress that would do just that. And so our panel today is assembled to help describe all the benefits of a national climate bank could deliver. While we are remote today, there is still a chance for you to submit questions and comments. Please feel free to share your thoughts with us by email at eesi at eesi.org or follow us on Twitter at eesi online. We will do our best to incorporate your input into the conversation. And now I get to introduce the first of our four fabulous speakers. Jeff Shubb is the executive director of the Coalition for Green Capital. He's a leading expert on green bank finance institutions that accelerate investment to cause an equitable clean energy transition. Jeff leads the coalition for green capital work around the world to create green banks, which have driven more than $4 billion of public and phil philanthropic investment in renewable power, building efficiency, and climate solutions. Jeff, welcome to the briefing. It's great to see you. I can't wait for your presentation. Great, thank you so much, Dan, and uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, I think you all can see my screen now. So uh, I will just jump right in. So as Dan said, uh, my name is Jeff Shubb. I'm the executive director of the uh, Coalition for Green Capital. We've been working at the federal level and at the state level and around the world for a decade to create uh, state and local and now national green banks. And so I wanna give you an overview, uh, starting with a uh, quick history right up front of the history of uh, federal green bank uh, policy and then walk through uh, the current proposals and why are they essential to uh, transition to a clean energy economy. So uh, as the pictures here show, the movement started back in 2009 with then representatives Ed Markey and Chris Van Hollen working together to introduce uh, federal green bank legislation that was uh, adopted with bipartisan support as an amendment to the Waxman Markey cap and trade bill. Uh, the provision had bipartisan support and passed out of the Senate ENR committee. Um, but for those who remember, uh, sadly, that bill never reached the floor of the Senate because it was tied up in cap and trade. Uh, but uh, Representative and then Senator Chris Van Hollen uh, kept the idea alive, reintroducing the bill several times. This led to then both Senators Markey and Van Hollen joining up again to reintroduce the National Climate Bank Act in, 20, in 2019. And we're soon joined by Representative Dingell introducing the National Climate Bank Act and now what is known as the Clean Energy and Sustainability Accelerator Act in 2021, which brings us to today. Uh, and what does that act do? It uh, has a one-time upfront federal appropriation to a independent nonprofit corporation that would act as a national green bank to fund and finance clean energy projects around the country, as well as fund and finance the operations of a network of state and local green banks all across the US. Uh, the proposal for the accelerator is uh, explicitly endorsed uh, by the President of the United States as part of the American Jobs Plan. It was also included in the President's uh, counteroffer a couple of weeks ago to Senator Capito as part of the bipartisan infrastructure conversation. Um, it has a wide set of supporters and endorsements, um, which we can talk about in detail, but I'd love to quickly go through the slides and give you an overview of uh, green banks and the federal proposal. So what is a green bank? This is always question number one. Um, uh, you put in $1 of public money and you leverage $3 of private co-investment and uh, the money turns green, which is this you know, cute graphic showing combining blue and yellow and you get green. Uh, what this leverage ratio represents is the actual, you know, more or less average leverage ratio of public and private money that actual green banks in the world have experienced and driven through their ongoing investment activity. And this represents what we sort of call the static project uh, level leverage, meaning in any given project, this number might, might vary, but on average, it works out to be three to one. Over time, this number actually increases because the National Green Bank, because it's an independent nonprofit, has the ability to both recycle its loans and issue new loans, and also to bar borrow money in capital markets on its own credit, which it couldn't do if it was part of the federal government. This number actually increases significantly over the course of time, which we see playing out with green banks in the real world uh, today. 
and as I said, this is uh, this is not just slideware. This is not theory. We know that this actually works, and you'll obviously hear from some green bank leaders in a moment. Uh, this map shows the 21 green banks in 15 states in the District of Columbia that over the last decade have proven out the effectiveness of this model. They've spent under $2 billion to cause $7 billion of total investment in the clean power platform. And this map is expanding rapidly. Our organization is currently working with uh, lawmakers, coalition, uh, coalitions of supporters, uh, stakeholders, market participants in 22 more states covering 37 states in the country. Um, in most of these states, these are bipartisan efforts. Uh, the Republican governor of Alaska introduced Green Bank legislation uh, about a month or so ago. Uh, there's bipartisan legislation in Maine. There's bipartisan legislation in Minnesota. Uh, there is bipartisan legislation in a number of states right now moving forward to create state Green Banks. Based on the proof of concept and the fact that this has been bipartisan or nonpartisan in many states across the country, um, the concept of leveraging private investment into clean energy just turns out to be uh, popular across party lines, creating jobs, as Dan said, uh, is a benefit, lowering energy costs is a benefit. These tend to be nonpartisan issues, hence the track record of bipartisan support, including bipartisan co-sponsorship for the House bill, the Accelerator, which is supported by Representative Fitzpatrick from Pennsylvania and Representative Young from Alaska, both of which have green banks either in operation or under development. What would the accelerator actually do on day one? It would fund and create state green banks in every single state in the country to do three things. It would help develop and deploy local solutions to local problems. It would involve the private sector, specifically investors, utilities, and contractors. And it would involve local stakeholders and communities to develop the solutions and ensure that all communities and, and uh, citizens and businesses are able to participate in the transition to a clean energy economy. What are the what are the what's the problem here? What are green banks actually designed to solve? So let's take a look at four different maps of the country. So the first problem is the carbon power platform uh, hits consumers harder and differently in different states across the country. I mean, typically folks talk about this in terms of the price per kilowatt hour of power, uh, which you know, in a state like Alabama or Mississippi, you might you know all think correctly. Well, the price per kilowatt hour is relatively low in those states. But ultimately, the thing that matters is not so much the price of the electricity, but the level of burden uh, placed on a household uh, compared to the income experienced in that household. And that's what this map shows is the energy burden across the US in the purple and darker blue states are where that burden is most significant. And unfortunately, this often lines up with states that have low income and other sort of economic indicators of distress. And what this map really shows is that the kinds of solutions that have to be deliver to delivered to each state really does need to vary based on the energy burden and the economics in each state. Second map shows where the carbon emissions actually are because states differ in their dependence on carbon power. And this state shows the red states are the ones with an absolute level of emissions that are the highest. This is not per capita, this is an absolute level. Um, interestingly, I, I, I think when we did this analysis before and people can check me, I think of the 12 red states, um, six of them voted for the Democratic presidential candidate and six of them voted for the Re Republican presidential candidate in the 2020 election. So the place and location and source of these emissions is a bipartisan problem. Uh, and that this also again tells us that the nature of the investment that has to be made in each of these states varies across the states according to the emissions profile. Third, and unfortunately this, this map uh, aligns quite well with, with this map, is uh, an indicator of just one of the uh, health uh, impacts, negative health impacts that come from these carbon emissions. This one happens to be the a rate of asthma attacks in children. And we can see the really dense concentration of this, of the health impacts on children uh, aligns pretty darn well with the location of those carbon emissions. So health is an important problem that needs to be resolved. And lastly, what's the problem is the, the nature of this transition is going to hit workers differently in different states. This map comes from a recent White House report on the issue of energy transition in energy communities, which identifies six uh, distinct regions of uh, high reliance on energy uh, fossil fuels for economic growth and job creation. These again line up with this, which lines up with this. 
um, which tells us again the nature of the kinds of investments that have to be made, where those investments have to go, and of course uh, there's pretty high alignment and correlation between the problems that have to be solved. And so today, what does the situation look like? This is a map showing wind and solar today across the country. The blue dots are solar, uh, excuse me, the blue dots are wind and the red dots are solar. Um, this is what it has to look like by 2050 to reach net zero. Um, basically, this tells us that clean energy projects need to be built and financed in every state in the country, all over the country. Um, we do see, not surprisingly, a concentration of blue uh, for wind in the upper Midwest, also very dense concentrations of offshore wind uh, along the Northeast coast and also on the West coast. And then of course, solar in states like Florida and across the Sun Belt. And the benefit of this transition to a uh, clean power system is it will increase household savings. Um, if you pair this large utility scale or distributed power investment with uh, household electrification, the kind of uh, the kind that Senator Heinrich wrote about specifically in the New York Times today through a house on a piece about household electrification. This is the benefit and we can see that the savings accrue to the households across the country where the deepest savings uh, are geographically focused in places where there is a high energy burden and a high reliance on fossil fuels. So uh, there's a lot of different ways that people talk about the potential pathways to a clean energy transition and what our energy system might look like in 2050. Um, there's studies from Princeton and Stanford and government organizations, but fundamentally they all actually have the same set of principles that involves a massive increase in market share from wind and solar power that has to multiply by about 7x over the next uh, several decades. There has to be a massive uh, increase in investment uh, in installation of high voltage transmission lines to carry the clean power to points of consumption. There needs to be battery storage uh, deployed across the entire grid. And there has to be a rapid conversion of heavily driven vehicles uh, from gas to electric. These are the kinds of activities that the accelerator is going to invest in across, this, across the entire country. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of conversation about the quality and, and uh, number of jobs that can be created through this kind of a clean energy transition and statements that jobs in the fossil fuel sector are intrinsically better or higher paying. Um, this is data gathered both from real world green bank activity as well as based on independent expert studies showing the kinds of jobs and the amount of job creation that could be realized through the, through the implementation of a national green bank, which shows fundamentally that these jobs are like all other jobs in the U.S. economy. Some of them are, are high paying, some of them are not, some of them are union, some of them are not. Um, the average uh, life, uh, span of a job in the mining industry, I believe, is 3.8 years in the U.S. And so turnover and moving on to new opportunities is an intrinsic part of the U.S dynamic uh, labor market as it exists today, um, that will remain true with the clean energy economy as well. And the jobs will be uh, abundant and specifically located in every community in the country because that's where the investment actually has to go. Uh, the proposal for the Clean Energy Accelerator or the National Green Bank is focused on and authorized to invest in seven different sectors, all of which have an emissions impact. their renewable power, grid infrastructure, transportation, buildings, uh, climate resilience, uh, indus industrial decarbonization, and sustainable ag and forestry, again, all of which have a direct tie or impact on the trajectory of climate change. As I said, the benefits of this will be realized in every community specifically because of the accelerator's ability to target its investments into each state, into communities, working with state and local green banks to tap into the local solutions that are needed to meet those local economies and communities' needs. Uh, the proposed $100 billion of the accelerator, as, as was put in the House bill, would lead to $800 billion of private co-investment over the next decade, nearly a trillion dollars of total investment. This, again, is due to the compounding leverage of uh, project-level co-investment, capital recycling and relending, and borrowing on the Green Bank's own credit without the full faith and credit of the government. This is not Fannie Mae, this is not a GSE, this is an independent nonprofit without the government's guarantee. Um, the impact is that there will be 4 million jobs created in four years in every community across the country. 
a critical component of this transition, though, as we all know, is that there has to be a just and economically fair transition. As the United Mine Workers of America put out in a recent statement, this transition must be a true transition. And boy, do we agree with that. Uh, the accelerator will be required to invest 40% of its investments into frontline low-income communities and energy-reliant uh, communities that are transitioning to a new economy. Um, this is a central part of the provision and is also built on the track record of what state and local green banks are already doing, significantly focusing their investments into underserved communities. What is the overall impact of this from an emissions standpoint? Independent expert analysis found that the accelerators, in, uh, the investments driven by the accelerator will reduce Americans' uh, emissions by about 20%. This is the single biggest climate reduction program per dollar in the American Jobs Plan. The bang for the buck here is significant. And again, this is not theory. This is not uh, slideware. This is based on the real world experience of what green banks have actually achieved. Uh, Wall Street calls rightly calls this the biggest investment opportunity of the century and something like a national green bank and a, a network of uh, green banks across the country need to be part of uh, the effort to lead the way for that investment opportunity. Um, uh, borrowing a little bit from my uh, boss, our CEO and co-founder, Reed Hunt. Uh, was uh, in a prior life the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission in the early 90s during the Clinton administration. As, as he often likes to say, we've done this kind of a big change before as quickly as we need to do it uh, today. Um, the communications platform effectively had uh, several trillion dollars of investment to completely turn over every element of that uh, platform in the course of about 15 years. Uh, there are a lot of similarities between the telecommunications grid that was rebuilt and the energy and electric grid that also has to be rebuilt. Uh, I don't need to go into detail on this, but suffice it to say, we know that this can be done because we've done it before and not that long ago. And so we can do it again. Um, and so summary uh, of the accelerator, um, it's going to create green banks and drive investment in every state. It delivers local solutions for local problems and is able to target it through its nonprofit structure. Um, and to learn more, the relevant bills are the Clean Energy and Sustainability Accelerator Act, HR 806, and in the Senate side, the National Climate Bank Act, Senate Bill 283, and happy to discuss in more detail about the, where those bills stand and the pathways to passage and any other details on green banks. So thank you so much. Thanks, Jeff, for a really excellent overview presentation. Um, and actually, it's a good opportunity to remind everyone that uh, while people are, are watching us right now, um, everything will be available online. So if you'd like to go back and look at any of Jeff's slides, I really like the way those four maps um, um, work together to tell the story of why this is so important. Um, and some additional resources as well that Jeff provided. Um, everything is available online at www.eesi.org. And you can watch the presentation too, because we'll have an archived webcast and um, some point in the near future, a written summary as well. Thanks, Jeff. That was a great presentation. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. Um, we will now turn to our second speaker. Um, Brian Garcia is the president and chief executive officer of the Connecticut Green Bank, the nation's first state level green bank. Uh, the green bank model demonstrates how smarter use of public resources can attract more private investment in the green economy, reducing the burden of energy costs on household and businesses, creating jobs in local communities, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions that cause global climate change. With its message of inclusive prosperity, the Connecticut Green Bank won the Innovations in American Government Awards in 2017 uh, by the Harvard Kennedy School's Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. Brian, um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, thank you, Dan, for that introduction. Um, I know Dan's going to get the, the slides up. But uh, I just wanted to kind of build off of uh, Jeff, Jeff's remarks earlier because the Connecticut Green Bank was actually created uh, following the representative Congressman Markey and Ben Holland's bill uh, in 2009, the American Clean Energies and Securities Act. So as that policy didn't move forward, uh, the uh, Reed Hunt, uh, working with uh, Governor Malloy, uh, Dan Esty here in the state of Connecticut, brought that federal model to the state of Connecticut, effectively creating uh, the Connecticut Green Bank on July 1st of uh, 2011. So we're actually uh, approaching our 10th year anniversary. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, so we are uh, a quasi-public organization. Uh, that is to say that uh, we're, we're very similar to a, a corporation of the state of Connecticut. We use 
private sector disciplines to achieve public sector goals. We're very focused on social and environmental profit as opposed to financial profit. Uh, we focus uh, per statute on financing clean energy. So clean energy in Connecticut has a specific definition, uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency, alternative fuel vehicles, associated infrastructure, uh, fuel cells are also considered uh, renewable energy here in the state of Connecticut because we manufacture them, creating lots of manufacturing jobs. Um, just yesterday, uh, the Connecticut legislature voted on a bipartisan basis to uh, expand the scope of the Connecticut Green Bank beyond clean energy to include environmental infrastructure, uh, which means that we can take this model to also support uh, waste and recycling efforts, um, agriculture, water, adaptation and resilience, uh, and other environmental markets, uh, parks and recreation. So uh, uh, the legislature is keen to see us uh, deploy more private investment in environmental infrastructure in the state. Uh, we're currently supported by two sources of public revenues, a system benefit fund, uh, as well as Reggie allowance proceeds, which comes to about $30 million per year. Our goal is to take that $30 million of public resources and attract multiples of private investment. So last year uh, we enabled uh, nearly $300 million of private investment in Connecticut's uh, clean energy economy. Uh, from a federal perspective, obviously, we are very uh, interested in seeing the accelerator move that will allow us to increase uh, our activity in the state of Connecticut. Uh, and uh, I will talk about uh, green bonds and our ability to issue bonds at the tail end. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so our focus is to confront climate change. Uh, and uh, by doing that, we want to ensure that we are increasing and accelerating the flow of private capital. So I think when, when people think of green banks, as Jeff has alluded to, uh, what we're essentially trying to do is take a limited amount of public resources, smartly manage those resources to invest them and mobilize multiples of private capital investment. Uh, when you get more investment, you get all of the benefits that we're after. Those benefits will effectively strengthen our communities uh, in Connecticut, especially vulnerable communities. That is a priority for us. Uh, vulnerable communities has a specific statutory definition here in the state of Connecticut. Um, and, and when we do that, we're gonna make the benefits of the green economy uh, inclusive and accessible to all individuals, families, and businesses. And I'll talk about some of those benefits in a second. Uh, and we are focusing on pursuing investment strategies that advance market transformation in green investing. The Green Bank model obviously does that. Um, I'm also going to talk about how our ability to issue bonds and how that uh, is helping to advance the Green Bank model as well. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, Dan, I, I liked your comments earlier about the payback from the customer's perspective, because that's that's exactly what we're trying to push away is, is thinking about payback. And rather than payback, we'd like customers to think about cash flow. Would you rather have more cash in your pocket today than you did before? Um, so this is trying to describe what the Green Bank model is after. Uh, you could think of an energy bill before you undertake any sort of clean energy improvement. Uh, go ahead, and Dan, and hit the button twice. Um, and, and what we're after is you could imagine um, uh, going to a, a home or a business, uh, providing them with um, opportunities for on-site renewable energy, conservation, load management, um, and providing that uh, end use customer with access to capital to finance those clean energy improvements to address those upfront costs. Um, and depending on the savings that can be created from those clean energy improvements, you could effectively create net savings. That's what we're after is to put more cash back in the pockets of that end use customer by reducing their energy bill giving them a debt service payment. It's important that the loans and leases that we offer are long-term maturity, consistent with the useful life of those measures, which can be up to 20 to 25 years. And when you do that, when you finance that, you leave more uh, value that you can give back uh, to that end use customer. So that's important, delivering them economic value upfront. And then we get from clean energy deployment, all those societal things that we're after cleaner energy, a more resilient grid, uh, and healthier uh, populations as a result of reducing uh, particulate matter. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so here's how the Green Bank model works from a supply side perspective. Go ahead and hit the button once. Um, so I was talking a little bit about those public resources that we receive, $30 million a year in uh, these public resources. Go ahead and hit it a couple more times. Let's go ahead and move through Great. So our goal is to utilize those public resources in a way that reduces the perception of risk from private investors. Our goal is to get them to invest in clean energy deployment in our state. And we do that by using our public resources first 
and we say we are willing to risk our public resources for you to put your capital into the market. Uh, and in Connecticut, we have about a six to one leverage ratio. Jeff showed a three to one. So we're about twice that uh, across our programs here in the state of Connecticut. And go and hit the button once more time. One more. There you go. So the financial returns go back to the private investors. These are loans. These aren't grants. It's important to say. So uh, we, um, we've had $500,000 of losses uh, over about $640 million of loans so far. I, I knocked on the wood here. Um, so the, these uh, loans pay back um, and ultimately go ahead and hit the button once more as a result of the, this increased investment in the green economy. We get all of those social and environmental benefits that we're after. Let's go to the next slide. Here's a quick look at them. Um, and, and I guess the, the key point I want to make here is that investment drives everything. So it, this is not just government investment. This is private investment. The more we can use a limited amount of public to enable more private, that investment is going to drive the deployment of clean energy. You know, in, our, in our context, it is uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency. Uh, when you deploy those technologies, you actually reduce the energy burden. You know, the percent of household income spent on energy or the percent of operating expenses paid on energy by businesses, uh, you're actually reducing that energy burden. Uh, and we get all the re results that we're after uh, as a quasi public or a government agency, economic development, we're seeing jobs being created as a result of that investment, tax revenues are generated that go back to the state to support other initiatives that the state policymakers want to achieve. As we deploy more clean energy, we get the reduction of, of emissions, greenhouse gas emissions to address climate change, as well as particulate matter uh, that improves public health as we reduce those particulates. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is just a, a high level overview, a bit, a bit of a tombstone uh, diagram for those of you who are in the banking community, uh, showing some of our public private partnerships over the years with a number of different local, uh, state, regional, uh, commercial banks, uh, national uh, banks, investment banks, uh, and the like, utilities, uh, all uh, enabled by our uh, participation in the deals to de-risk transactions and to make the market for clean energy investment in Connecticut attractive to their capital formation. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so I wanted to walk through, give you an example of a few uh, projects. Uh, this first one here is an energy infrastructure example, and this has to do with making residential solar PV and energy efficiency affordable and accessible to low to moderate income families and communities of color. Uh, Jeff was talking earlier about uh, energy burden, the percentage of household income spent on energy. 6% uh, is what's deemed affordable. Anything greater than that is unaffordable. Uh, our low to moderate income families in Connecticut can pay 10, 15, 20% or more of their household income on energy. Uh, that creates an affordability gap. Uh, Connecticut's affordability gap for low income families is about $1,400. We have proven through direct data collection uh, that we are able to reduce that affordability gap by $1,300 through a financial innovation of combining solar PV with energy efficiency uh, through a partnership that we have with Posigen Solar. Um, again, we structure a lot of private investment around this transaction and to the diagram I showed before, uh, our goal is to uh, reduce the energy burden by displacing uh, those upfront capital costs with the financing solution that puts cash in the pockets uh, of, of participants. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, here's an example of a waste infrastructure uh, project. Uh, we have a food waste uh, challenge here in the state of Connecticut. So uh, we are developing uh, anaerobic digesters that would collect uh, food from large producers across the state uh, to various centralized uh, anaerobic digesters. Uh, that digester gas, methane gas, would be utilized, actually it is in this facility here in Southington, Connecticut, quantum biopower, uh, utilizes that gas and produces on-site combined heat and power, uh, participating in the renewable portfolio standard. In this transaction, uh, we participated with People's Bank. Uh, we provided subordinated debt at 20% of the capital stack. They provided 80% of the remaining debt. Uh, again, we, we are for first loss and it's our participation in the deal that's drawing in local commercial lenders into the policy climate in, in this uh, environmental economy. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, here's an example of a water infrastructure project. Uh, Connecticut, uh, all of New England and the Northeast for, for that matter, have a number of old and aging dams, uh, all of them needing to be refurbished or either torn down, refurbished or turned into hydropower. 
Uh, we happen to work with a, a company that has licensed a European uh, run of river uh, technology uh, and is now producing uh, hydropower at this restored uh, dam in uh, Meriden, uh, Connecticut. Uh, this transaction utilized a bond structure. We're, we're selling the power uh, to the local town of Meriden for a, over a 30 year period um, with the opportunity to go to 40 years. Um, so this is providing value back to the town in terms of savings. Uh, and we've worked with uh, Key Bank, Bank of America, Webster Bank, and a number of other financial institutions on this transaction. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just as I was alluding to before, um, we have really been inspired. We have the ability to issue bonds per statute. Um, so that's, that's, that's unique uh, to Connecticut. Not all green banks have that capability. Uh, we were inspired by the Series E war bonds of the 1940s. Uh, $185 billion was raised by over 85 million Americans who uh, wanted to support our government uh, in the fight against Nazi Germany. Um, that $185 billion in today's uh, value raised over a four year period uh, was about $3 trillion. Um, so we were inspired by that to say that couldn't we issue bonds to raise capital by selling those bonds to citizens? So typically bonds, green bonds, for those of you who are in the market are sold to institutional investors at $5,000 face value bonds and they'll buy hundreds of thousands of them. In our case, we wanted to get citizens to uh, provide them an opportunity to buy fixed income bonds uh, to support uh, investments in clean energy in Connecticut. Uh, there are three elements to these bonds. One is the use of proceeds has to support the Paris Agreement. Uh, that is that they have to go towards mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions and adaptation and resiliency to the impacts of climate change. Uh, the second thing is that the bond face value has to be no more than $1,000. Uh, and lastly, because we're issuing them to citizens, we want uh, there to be certification and verification that the use of proceeds is going towards uh, the intended purpose. Uh, so this is the Green Liberty Bond. Uh, we had a $25 million raise that we were working on this last Earth Day, April 22nd. We had $100 million of demand. Um, we sold, bond, sold these bonds to Connecticut citizens and people across the country who wanted to invest in Connecticut, uh, including institutional investors, municipalities, and others, uh, all wanting to see uh, investment happen in the clean energy economy in the state of Connecticut. Uh, next slide, last slide. Uh, so this is just to say, uh, our, the name of our comprehensive plan is, is Green Bonds Us. You know, I just talked about green bonds as a financial mechanism, us being capital U.S. You know, we sell green bonds to citizens in, in the U.S., but it also means green, the environment bonds us, it unites us. So, so really, our focus in the future is to continue to enable more investment by helping to reduce energy burden, deliver all these societal benefits that we're after, because when we do that, we're actually demonstrating care and concern for our fellow uh, citizen and people in the community. So our vision statement is a planet protected uh, by the love of humanity. And I think that's our last slide, Dan. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, in my intro, I use the words innovation and creativity, and um, you just, uh, our audience just saw that in practice. Thanks so much for a great presentation of all the cool stuff. Um, I also think it's fascinating sort of how Connecticut's Green Bank's programs have evolved over time. Um, it's an excellent story. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, before, we, before I introduce our third panelist, I just wanted to um, remind our audience that if you have questions or comments, um, you are welcome to send them to us. We'll do our best to incorporate them into the conversation after our fourth panelist. Uh, you can send an email to eesi at eesi.org. You can also follow us on Twitter at eesi online. Um, our third panelist is Duan Andrade. She is founder and president of Evolution Business Development Incorporated, a consulting firm specializing in sustainable business practices. Uh, Duan has extensive experience in microfinance, micro lending, sustainability, strategic planning, and clean energy projects. And she was also an adjunct professor at the Anahuac uh, University Latin American Center for Social Responsibility. Uh, she is responsible for providing strategic direction and oversight of the financial and operational aspects of the nonprofit Solar and Energy Loan Fund, or SELF. Uh, she, down in Florida, she has served as self-strategic advisor and CFO since January 2013. Welcome to the briefing. I can't wait to hear your presentation and see your slides. 
Thank you very much. Wow, you took me back in time there with that intro. <laughs> Thank you. It's a real honor to be here uh, sharing this uh, panel and just sharing with everybody you know, what we are doing here in Florida with uh, our Green Bank, which is a different model. And I just love, I mean, I'm going after Brian and that's a, a you know, tall, tall order to follow. But um, I love that Brian presented a Green Bank model that is really kind of a top bottom big investment opportunities um, and really um, highlights the possibilities where there is also a positive policy environment, you know. So I'm going to show you what SELF does in Florida um, with zero policy to incentivize um, these investments. So I just need to share my screen here. Can you confirm that everybody can see, whoops, can you see the presentation? Uh, not yet. Uh, we can see that you started the screen share, but we don't see that. I'm sorry, let me try this again. Okay, how about now? Uh, yes, now it's working. All right, thank you. Well, the Solar and Energy Loan Fund, known as SELF today, is a certified CDFI. And of course, we have technology problems. Okay, so a little bit of background. We are the first and only nonprofit green bank in Florida. We started in, uh, we were founded in 2009, actually by a group of, um, at the time, commissioners, including the founder of this organization, Doug Coward, who is now the executive director. And this was right after the housing crisis. Um, so SELF was created with the intention of revitalizing the economy through green jobs. And at the time, um, President Obama had signed in the ARA, which was the American uh, Recovery Act, which much like today was trying to help the economy recover. So this vision of creating an inclusive green economy came about and SELF was founded with a $3 million grant from the US Department of Energy. In 2012, um, you know, they decided that um, they needed to create a model which would leverage more capital because $3 million were not going to go too far. So in 2012, SELF became a certified community development finance institution. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that, the CDFIs were created to fill financing gaps um, and to serve communities that are left behind by traditional banks. And basically what it does, it provides a, uh, a channel to reach underserved communities um, and do work that banks did not want to do. So the, the CDFIs have a mandate to do 60% of their lending in low and moderate income census tracts. So what SELF did was really take the CDFI model that was typically structured to do SBA loans and affordable housing and all that, and actually use it to do green loans, mainly initially energy efficiency and clean energy. So the other thing that we innovated in was really shifting the banking paradigm of lending based on credit scores to doing lending based on ability to repay, not on credit scores, income, and assets. And that is basically um, micro lending methodology that we um, imported and we applied and now has um, turned out to be you know, quite successful. So as a result of this, um, what we did was we leveraged those $3 million with $25 million to date. Actually, we just closed a, a few more investments. So again, that leveraging ratio in our case is about eight to one. Um, we have deployed $18 million in unsecured single family home improvement loans. So again, we are like bottom up. We um, do our work at the grassroots level and we provide direct loans to homeowners, small average size $10,000 loans. These $18 million loans, $18 million in loans have been deployed um, with a, about 54% of those clients having less than 680 credit scores. We've done about 2,050 home improvements in Florida with a small portion in Alabama, South Carolina. We're about to open up Georgia. And 74% of our clients are low to moderate income. 
our average default rate to date has been less than 2%. In addition to helping low and moderate income uh, homeowners access affordable financing based on ability to repay rather than credit scores, we also recruit contractors to do the jobs. And we focus on recruiting um, mom pop shops, minority contractors. So for example, one of our local contractors has done more than a million dollars in business uh, using our financing. To date, we have over 600 contractors in our network. and um, they're all being um, able to reach underserved markets with our financing avail uh, available to them at no cost to them. We also, uh, as a green bank, are able to leverage more capital. So we just got a $5 million uh, JP Morgan Chase grant in 2019 that will allow us and has allowed us to create a new um, fund that is really focused on filling gaps in financing stacks for affordable housing. So we want to do green affordable housing. What that means is kind of what Brian was talking about, that we have to reduce the energy burdens for low income residents. And many of those residents are uh, renters in affordable housing buildings. And they get a rent subsidy, but ultimately they have to pay their energy bills and their energy bills take up a large disproportionate amount of their income. So we want to push the affordable housing sector into a green housing uh, stock that can be lower cost to operate and to live in uh, comfortably and with dignity. So we're gonna do uh, 300 affordable, we're gonna finance 300 affordable housing units leveraging $65 million. Again, that is a huge leveraging about 18 to one. And then we also um, have a $50 million commitment from our investor for our PACE program, which is exclusive to St. Lucie County. So that being said, I'm gonna go quickly from here on and I wanna share some stories with you. We, our mission is to rebuild and empower underserved communities by providing access to affordable, innovative financing um, for sustainable property improvements, including energy efficiency, renewable energy, wind hazard, which is storm mitigation. We do water quality and disability and aging in place home adaptations. So this is just the picture kind of take a home and what do we do? And you can see that we basically will do everything that is gonna um, improve the structure and make it more efficient to reduce those energy burdens, um, save money and be able to free up cash to repay the loans. So these are some of our um, lending programs. And with that, what this speaks to is that we have customized programs for the type of markets that we are serving. So our CDFI flagship program, basically no minimum credit score, unsecured, five to 10.99%, that's the terms go from three to 10 years and so on. But the one program I wanna focus on for a second is Kiva. So as a green bank, these are um, the things that we can do because we work in a space that most traditional lenders don't wanna work in and we also are know how to underwrite savings and climate. Um, so we are able to create programs like our Kiva program, which is a crowdfunded peer-to-peer -peer lending program. What that does is it allows us to post uh, one of our lowest income clients or zero credit um, score clients, um, veterans, single women, heads of household, the most distressed clients, we can post on Kiva and raise funds to, for a loan globally from about 1.7 million micro investors across the globe. So we have funded loans, $10,000 loans with 200 people from four different continents. And we're bringing capital into our communities to help the lowest income, the most distressed clients. And, and similarly, we're shifting paradigms by giving them the lowest income and the most distressed, lowest score clients, the lowest cost loan because we believe that financing should be equitable and people that have less should be paying less instead of paying more so that being said in addition to our loans we don't just give loans what we do is we really um, protect the client and we protect the contractor so once we approve a loan the contractor gets a notice well the client picks their contractor out of our contractor network the contractor does the job and then we pay the contractor directly. Um, we also include financial coaching or um, 
uh, credit rebuilding because we do report to credit bureaus so people can rebuild their credit with us. We also make sure that the project is done to the client satisfaction, but also to code and passes all inspections. So we're protecting the client and we're also ensuring that the contractor gets paid. And of course, we're creating more jobs for contractors. But this is just a snapshot. It's interesting, and I wanted to show you this, that wind hazard mitigation is 40% now of our total lending. Energy efficiency is the number one, and solar is, a still, is still a small portion of our lending. And if you look on the other side, our client by income levels, you'll see that 76%, this was as of this year, um, is low to moderate income. So, you know, people think that, oh, we just have to, we're, we have to go solar immediately. And yes, we do. And yes, we want to. But the fact of the matter is that low and moderate income communities have a need, a lot of work done before they can go solar. They need to fix their roofs. They need to access home insurance. They need to become more energy efficient. And like Brian was describing, we need to really um, reduce the energy demand before we go solar. So what this shows us is that the market really needs energy efficiency, um, climate resilience and solar, and all of those have to be available. So other programs that we have are multifamily, uh, nonprofit community ener energy improvement loans. And these are, um, again, new funds that we're going to be using to fill capital stacks to be able to do more affordable housing that is green, energy efficient and resilient. And also, as a green bank, we're able to innovate and we're able to access philanthropic funds. So we're able to get a grant from the Lowenstein Foundation to be able to do the first rooftop solar on a public housing building in Florida. This is in Miami-Dade. And for the first time ever, we're gonna put um, a solar system for emergency response with battery storage on a building that houses 92 low-income vulnerable elderly um, residents. Just a few stories. This is a picture of our program manager of the Treasure Coast of Florida. And Carol is a widow that was recovering from back surgery, had no credit. Her husband had passed. He had all the credit. And as you can see in the picture, she has a back brace. Um, she had no AC in her, uh, her home. Her AC had gone out and nobody would give her a loan. She had been rejected six times before a contractor referred her to us. She came in with her friend, we were able to get her a loan immediately, and this is her the moment she found out, and she literally cried. Pamela Turner, U.S. veteran, single mother, three jobs. Um, she is a cancer survivor. She has three jobs to keep up her four kids. Her roof was damaged by a hurricane. She had buckets in her home. Her, everything was you know, falling apart. She could not get a loan. She came to us, we were able to raise funds for her through Kiva. She got her loan, she got a new roof. She's now safe and healthy. And Mark Stanhope is a US postmaster, lived, uh, worked all his life at, at the post office. And he was able to get a solar system installed in his home in St. Pete. And here he is very proud. Um, this was last year during COVID and um, very proud to be able to access his um, solar system. So just a quick snapshot of our capital um, composition. You can see here, well, actually in 2013, this was just one pie. We basically had the DOE grant. And since then we have 25 investors, including faith-based organizations that you see right there. They were the ones that helped us get to where we are now. Then we have bank CRA investments, non-government grant loan capital, basically like a JP Morgan Chase grant that is actually for loan capital. We have health systems that have invest invested in us, private capital such as PACE, and then the government funding, the federal funds are only 16% of our capital stack right now. So this is what we can do as green banks. And if we wanna serve LMIs, then uh, um, LMI communities, we can do it through a CDFI structure. So just to finalize, this is, how we see green banks able to generate social impacts, environmental impacts, and economic impacts um, in a kind of one-stop shop. Thank you. Thank you for that excellent presentation. And thanks also for helping put faces uh, with these projects. Um, it helps so much to remember that it's not just about insulation and solar panels. It's about the people who live in the houses that are better insulated and are powered by solar and whose lives are um, 
improved by these sorts of investments. So thank you very, very much for a great presentation. Um, our fourth panelist uh, is joining us from Colorado. Uh, Brittany Heller has been in the solar industry in a variety of roles since January 2015, including uh, residential project development, construction and training. Uh, in 2018, she joined Grid Alternatives uh, Colorado, uh, where she is now the Senior Manager of Workforce and Community Engagement. Brittany and her team host paid solar job training programs across the state with a strong focus on providing opportunities for individuals facing barriers to employment. Welcome, Brittany. I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Let me get my sh screen shared here. Um, wonderful. Can you guys see that all right? Looks great. Awesome. Great. Um, so thank you, you guys, uh, for having me today and this opportunity to speak this morning. Um, as Dan mentioned, my name is Brittany Hiller, and I work for a nonprofit called Grid Alternatives Colorado. So I will hop right in and tell you a little bit more about Grid Alternatives. Um, Grid Alternatives' mission is to build community-powered solutions to advance economic and environmental justice through renewable energy. Uh, and for the past 20 years, Grid Alternatives, uh, and we are the nation's largest nonprofit solar installer, uh, we have been working with communities most impacted by economic and climate injustices to bring the benefits of clean energy and jobs to all individuals and families. Um, and we will not achieve a clean energy future in Colorado without addressing the systemic injustices that have disproportionately impacted communities of color. The benefits of renewable energy, which are cleaner air, long lasting careers, and lower energy bills must not be limited just to the privileged. Um, so low income communities and communities of color are oftentimes left out of the conversations about our clean energy future. Um, our work at GRID has brought meaningful energy savings to families, uh, reduced greenhouse gas emissions, and provided hands-on training and experience for solar job seekers. Clean energy can be transformative for people, the planet, and the economy. A growing solar industry needs, a skilled, uh, needs skilled workers at all levels. Clean, um, clean energy jobs are meaningful and they pay well too. Um, with Grid Alternatives hands-on training, individuals learn solar skills while participating in and building real-world solar installations. We make these training opportunities accessible to groups that have been traditionally underrepresented in the solar industry, including women, people of color, and those impacted by the criminal justice system. Our graduates jumpstart lifelong careers, uh, connecting with our employer networks, or sometimes starting their own successful business ventures. Um, Grid Alternatives has installed over 11 megawatts of solar for underserved communities in Colorado since 2013. Uh, included in our project portfolio is a 1.2 megawatt community solar array, which we built in partnership with the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. Uh, and this is also in one of those priority regions that Jeff had mentioned earlier. Um, this project will provide electricity for 112 tribal residents, businesses, and enterprises. And it's an important step forward uh, for the tribe as they transition to a clean energy future and advance their own energy sovereignty. 14 tribal members in this project joined GRID to install the solar array, 11 of which were hired as interns. So they gained solar installation experience and valuable transferable skills. Several of the interns also worked for the tribe's public works department, um, and that will be the tribal entity who's gonna be managing and maintaining their own solar system moving forward. Uh, and this particular system will offset at least 10% of the reservation's overall energy usage, and it's gonna be eliminating about 1,500 tons of greenhouse gas emissions by year one. And this is just one example of what can happen with the deployment of renewable energy advancing tribal energy sovereignty, bringing meaningful jobs to individuals, and transforming communities. And the solar industry, it's growing rapidly across the United States. As more states follow Colorado's lead in setting targets for achieving 100% renewable energy, solar deployment will continue to grow, as will the need for a skilled workforce. 
Um, according to the National Solar Job Census from 2020, the path necessary to achieve President Biden's goals um, to decarbonize the grid and expand domestic manufacturing will require more than 900,000 solar workers across the supply chain by 2035. Uh, and this is going to take a considerable financial investment to achieve. Um, and this data is also compiled by the National Solar Job Census, uh, and it demonstrates that there's continued growth in the solar industry, um, and it's also becoming more and more diverse. Uh, in 2020, nearly all demographic measures of diversity in the solar workforce saw modest increases, bringing the numbers to an all-time high in most categories since they've been measuring it. Um, and diversity is comparable to other industries and is growing, but there certainly needs to be a lot more work done uh, before the solar industry matches the diversity of the United States. Environmental justice and equity need to remain at the center of policy priorities and growth planning. Uh, and financial investment in clean energy programming and in initiatives will contribute to the growth of jobs as the industry rises to um, rises to work at the intersectionality of climate change, energy justice, and a transition to a clean energy future. And as the renewable energy continues to grow, so does compensation. Uh, and this is also a point Jeff brought up in his, um, in his chat as well. Um, and continued growth in compensation will be really important to ensure a, dress, a just transition to a clean energy future. And, you know, of course, in 2020, the pandemic contributed to a, contributed to a reduction in solar jobs. Um, several states, including Colorado, saw modest levels of employment growth or lower levels of job loss. Um, Colorado has seen a 35% employment growth rate in the solar industry since 2015 and remains one of the top states for solar jobs per capita. As Colorado continues to work aggressively to meet the state goals of achieving 100% renewable energy by 2040, grid alternatives will continue to provide valuable workforce training for those seeking career pathways in the clean energy sector. The transition to a clean energy future is happening, and to achieve a just transition together requires investment funding. The creation of a national climate bank would have significant impact on advancing equitable access to clean energy, preventing greenhouse gas emissions, and creating critical jobs. So I've talked a little bit about some of the numbers, but I wanted to put some faces to those numbers um, and tell you guys about a few uh, trainees who came through Grid Alternatives programs. Uh, this is one of our trainees, Michael Martinez. He came to our program after being out of work for several months. Uh, and like many, he had been struggling with the pandemic and the repercussions. Uh, and just a little over a month ago, him and his mom had stopped by our offices at Grid Alternatives. Um, and she was just gushing about how proud she was of her son and this new job where he is building huge solar arrays at the Denver International Airport. Um, so being able to come to a paid solar job, change, uh, solar job training program changed absolutely everything for Michael. Another remarkable story comes from a trainee, Paul Matthews. Uh, he had been in contact with GRID for quite some time to get enrolled in our paid solar job training program. He was really excited about blending his military experience with his unmanned aircraft license to build his very own solar drone company. Um, and so now he works at a local solar branch office, building out their site survey and drone department while also building a drone company of his own. Training gave him the knowledge and the skills that he needed to gain employment as well as build his business in the solar industry. With the right investment, we can build an economy that is transformative for Colorado, inclusive for all individuals, and creates a clean energy future. So thank you guys so much, and I will hand it back to Dan. Thank you, Brittany, for a great presentation. Um, also just wanna commend you on the paid training. <laughs> um, makes all the difference in the world. Um, is that something that's a recent or is that, is that something that's recent or is that something that has been sort of integral to this from the start? 
Um, particularly for uh, Grid Colorado's office, that has been uh, an effort for quite a while to make everything right. paid training. But as you can imagine, particularly as it relates to people with barriers to employment, a lot of folks can't just take unpaid time to get the skills they need to eventually get a higher paying job. So having that ability really advances equity and inclusion in the industry. Yeah, it it's, makes such a difference. So thank you so much for a great presentation. Um, there's still an opportunity to ask questions. Um, if you would like, um, people in our audience are welcome to ask questions either follow, following us on Twitter at ESI online. They can also send us an email EESI at EESI.org. Um, but it is my pleasure to uh, now introduce my colleague, uh, senior associate Miguel Yanez. Miguel works very, very hard uh, with our Envoy financing program, interacting with green banks, rural utilities around the country. He is going to kick off our Q&A. So Miguel, I will turn it over to you and stand by. Hi, thank you, Dan. And, and thank you everyone for uh, taking the time to, uh, to watch this, this great briefing. And, and we have really heard great presentations from, uh, from this great lineup of speakers. Um, and so I, uh, one, one common thing that have really run through through all the presentations is um, how all of them, how all the uh, green banks and, 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 and work by, by Britain in, in Colorado have really uh, strived to uh, include everyone, increase equity uh, by spurring clean energy development. Um, and so I would like to ask you, um, how do you, um, provide services to underserved communities, communities of color, and low and moderate income households, and how would that increase with additional capital from a national climate bank? Um, and so uh, I would like to start with, uh, with Jeff. Uh, we haven't heard from you since the beginning, so it would be great if you can um, start us off, and then we'll go in the order of the presentations with uh, Brian uh, next, and then Duane, and then Brittany. Um, so take it away, Jeff. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Miguel. Um, yeah, I mean, it's sort of the, the premise of addressing underserved communities and delivering energy and climate justice and supporting those who are um, have the least access to these kinds of solutions is, is central to the Green Bank model and is built into the, to the federal proposal as well. Um, you know, what this comes down to in many ways is you got to combine the right local capacity and knowledge with the right kinds of funding. Um, addressing equity and access is intrinsically very, very localized and is really about meeting folks where they are and understanding their needs and their challenges and their barriers. Um, and so it's really, really hard to resolve that with a standardized national scale solution. It, it really requires engaging local partners, which is a, a big reason why the national proposal was built around a, a national network-based structure working with state and local green banks and other sort of financial partners. Um, and so it sort of empowers uh, local partners to, to, to develop the solutions that are necessary. But the capital piece here is essential because um, yes, there's sort of the, the, the points that Juan made and that we all know well about, you know, if you don't have the right credit score and you don't have the right income level, you can't qualify for a standard loan. And those standard loans aren't really well suited for this kind of financing because they're not the right terms anyhow. And so it's really a question of how do you deliver the right terms? And knowing you know you have to meet the market where it is and meet the customers where they are and in some cases that means you know four percent financing for eight years sometimes it's one percent financing for 15 years sometimes half of it is paid with a subsidy and half of it's paid with financing and repaid and just the need to be flexible about that is crucial i mean we can't pretend like everything has to be done on specific commercial terms um, but it needs to be sort of the power of that flexibility needs to be built into the federal proposal and then feed down to the network of local partners. And then the last thing I'll say before letting others jump in is, you know, in our sort of work around the country over the last, you know, decade, but really, especially in the last years, two years digging into this question, one thing that comes up over and over and over again is, is not just the need for local solutions, but uh, local participation in decision making and how those solutions come together and are actually implemented. This feeling of needing to have and wanting to have local control, whether it's sort of uh, advisory bodies or committees that have a say in how programs are designed to literally developing cooperative ownership structures for community solar projects so people literally control the assets that are being built. Um, 
it is about finance and delivering that kind of capital solution, but there's a process element to this too that's essential to how this is all rolled out. Great. Uh, this is Brian, just following up on Jeff here. Um, so the example I was giving earlier of, of solar for all, uh, that is one arrow uh, in our quiver. You know, that is for uh, low to moderate income families that own homes. Uh, unfortunately, in the state of Connecticut, and I'm sure across the country, um, Black and Hispanic families own less than 5% of their homes versus white families at 85%. So uh, even though we're able to demonstrate that we can completely eliminate the energy affordability gap, uh, it's only for a small subset of the population. So, so that's to say that um, there are no silver bullets. Uh, we need to identify a number of other strategies. Uh, here in Connecticut, we spent a lot of time over the last year uh, working within a regulatory structure uh, to get the rules right, uh, get the compensation right. Uh, we have a, a chair of our public utilities regulatory authority who has put energy affordability as the number one uh, objective uh, for the regulator, uh, which then translates into um, bid preferences, adders, uh, other treatments for um, low-income families, affordable housing uh, families. So when you get that context right, the regulatory structure right, uh, then you're now starting to attract the right developers to come in and do the projects, ultimately getting to the reduction of energy burden on our most vulnerable citizens. So, so we've been spending a lot of time getting those regulatory rules right. Um, uh, how would all this uh, increase with additional capital from the National Climate Bank? I mean, you know, I, I talked about us having 30 million uh, and turning that into over $300 million a year using uh, state resources. Uh, by having federal resources, uh, you know, we're going to go further. We're just touching the, the surface of the available market in the state of Connecticut. So we've probably reached maybe 5 to 10% of the available market, uh, which means we have a lot more investment to go. Uh, so the National Climate Bank would uh, provide us with capital to enable us to bring in more private investment to deliver more uh, value to families and businesses. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to uh, being a, a continued partner with the uh, Accelerator and other green banks across the country to that end. Sorry, okay, well, there's so much I'd like to say about this, but I know I have limited time, so I'm just gonna, um, this is kind of our core mission, right? What we do and I would start by saying to the question of how can we better serve LMI, I would start by saying that the first thing we need to do is change the way we think about LMI. You know, it's just like, no, that is not a riskier market per se, de facto. Uh, LMI communities are not LMI because they're lazy or poor or don't have assets. LMI communities don't trust banks. They don't trust the systems. So we, uh, that's the first thing I urge everybody to do is kind of shift that thought and look at LMI also in a spectrum because LMI together, those, you know, those low and moderate together span a big spectrum, 30% to 120% average median income. That's the definition of LMI. The difference between somebody living on 30% average median income and 120, 80 to 120% is abysmal. So we have to really understand what the market needs are in that LMI category. So that being said, if you've all heard of the United Way term Alice, that's a really good description of the moderate, the M part of LMI, which is asset limited, income constrained and employed or income earning a population described as Alice, they're straddling the line of poverty, not poor enough to get grants, not rich enough to be able to access affordable financing. They're stuck in the middle. About 40% of Americans fall into that category. This is an opportunity right there, waiting to be served, but they don't qualify per the banking standards that are existed. So, how do we reach these markets? We look at them as, a, as potential credit worthy people. We understand their needs. We customize products to be able to accommodate to their cash flows. So I think these are the things we're doing. Um, and that's why it's really important to consider all of these models that you've heard about here, 
are doing things differently. It's not, we're, we're not, we're not like inventing financing. We're just applying it in a different way and successfully because we are proving that these markets that have been left behind or skipped over or whatever actually work. They are good investments. And I just want to say that with a um, national climate bank, um, it would unlock not only what Brian said, I'm going to echo his words. I mean, we're just like starting here. We're going to leverage those funds a hundred times over and over and over again, because we've proven we have done just small, a small sample of $18 million in 2000 projects, 74% LMI, they pay back and we're redeploying those funds over and over again. And the other thing is that if we want to go net uh, carbon neutral or want to really impact our carbon emissions, we do need to go renewable. We need to go solar or geothermal or whatever renewable energy is applicable in, in, in each state. But here's the thing, you realized in our portfolio that we don't have enough solar. That's because we, not only the, the market isn't ready, but we don't have the right type of flexible financing. With the National Climate Bank, we would have the long-term flexible low-cost financing to be able to provide more solar to those markets. Think of it, 40% of America. That's... Sorry, I get very passionate about this. <laughs> Yeah, I really appreciate you saying a lot of that um, as well. Um, and as for grid alternatives, how do we, uh, you know, connect with these underserved communities? Um, the real way to do that for us is just being really embedded into the communities. Uh, we have really strong networks with community-based organizations. We network through those. We have reciprocal partnerships um, all throughout the communities where we work with mission-aligned organizations. Um, and if we were to have additional sources of funding, we would be able to scale up our existing programs at a much, you know, bigger level than where we are currently. Um, and we'd also be able to begin to offer new programs with this additional capacity. Um, at GRID um, and an organization and how we function, we'll oftentimes get projects that sort of fall into our lap and then figure out how are we going to fund this? And it is really, really challenging. Um, it would be really great to flip flop that, be able to have a source of funding and then be able to go to those partners. Um, and as I'm thinking about this, I mean, we have several different nonprofit organizations who are almost in line, you know, we're trying to figure out the special sauce to make these projects happen. Um, you know, if they were to get solar projects on their rooftop, they'd be able to save money on their utility bills um, and they'd be able to put that money back into their programs, you know, immediately. Um, and GRID, how our organization runs, we can have trainees on those projects. It's another way to help folks get experience. Um, but it's just tough to find the funding to make it happen. Um, so having a national climate bank would just turn this issue on its head for us. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. And uh, those were really uh, thoughtful responses and really uh, how you all really um, bring out your, your how passionate are, uh, you all are about green banks and, and how national green bank can, can really um, spark clean energy development. And, and so my, my second question goes to a lot of the points that Brittany has just made on, on how uh, she partners uh, with um, uh, local state, um, uh, local entities. So um, to that, my question is, how do you work with um, existing federal, state, and local stakeholders, including the private sector, to provide um, and support clean energy investments? So um, brilliantly, you, 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 you're starting to talk about how you work um, in a way to embed it with communities. If you can start us off with that question, uh, with providing an example, um, that, that, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned uh, in my last answer, we can always find a really great, innovative, impactful project. Um, and then what's always challenging for us is finding that funding. Um, and so we are often stringing together public funds. You know, we work with local and federal agencies. Uh, an example that comes to mind immediately is utilizing CDBG dollars or community development block grants, which are, you know, essentially HUD dollars. Um, and it's great because when we are able to get connected to that, those funds, 
all of the benefits go to the homeowners that we're working with. Um, we also do work a lot with the private sector as well. Um, and there's some benefits there. They can utilize tax credits, um, but they also need to see a return on investment. And depending on what their appetite is there, that can eat into those benefits um, of the project that could be you know, more equity focused, more reaching those LMI um, customers. So it's a, it's a fine balance, but if there was, again, additional funding, more access to funding, we could be doing so much more and also less energy of our time would be chasing all these different various funding streams. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's that's for good alternatives. Great, thank you, Brittany. Um, if we could continue with Duane, um, that would be great. Thanks. Sure, thank you. Uh, well, I think there are many, many opportunities uh, to leverage uh, capital and um, relationships. So we work very closely with local government, for example. Um, in our expansion, we have relied on local governments to provide seed grants for capacity building because we run on such thin margins that we don't really have the venture capital or the capacity to expand on our own. So local governments have their own goals and, and Florida doesn't really have like these incentives and big goals as a state. So each local government is taking reins, you know, of their own, um, uh, sustainable development. And so, for example, St. Pete, uh, Hillsborough County, Orange County, City of Orlando, I mean, I can name many that we're working with, um, have all these goals. They want to go, you know, they sign up for the Sierra 100 renewables, they say, sign up for all these things, but then the question is, how do we get there? Like, well, how do we do it? So we are an implementation tool, and that is how we uh, frame ourselves. If you have goals as a local government, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to spend all this money in creating these. Uh, we come in and we'll do the work for you. So that's how we've been able to really leverage um, partnerships and local governments. We also work very closely with other nonprofits, for example, financial coaching. We don't do that ourselves. We partner with nonprofits that are specialists in that. So, you know, that's an efficient way of doing that. Um, we also work with organizations that are job training and doing audits and things like that. So that partnership, um, leveraging those partnerships is really important. And to Brittany's point, I think we also need to get better uh, at connecting resources, for example, light heap and ship programs and all that, you know, we have people that that don't know how to access that. So we can, we are um, a, a resource center for everybody as well. And I think that the, um, um, one of the important things to note is that in those communities, when we partner, everybody wins. And there's always a bank that needs CRA credits. So then we can leverage that capital as well. And we can bring in more capital. So I think that it's really important to note that we're not trying to do this work on our own. We don't want to, and we can't. This is really bringing together public, private, philanthropic funds. And, you know, I gave some examples, the, the solar system on the public housing building that is grant dollars, and it's going to be an example to replicate. And another great example we have is working with Martin County Utilities. We've created a septic to sewer conversion loan with them. They are collecting on bill. We leverage their $200,000 with $2 million, and it's a win-win-win for everybody. So that's just an example of how, how we can leverage those partnerships. Great. And, and in terms of Connecticut, so I was, I was thinking about what are some of the more recent uh, state federal in interactions and engagements between our state and the federal government? The one that came to my mind was uh, Connecticut, we have really ambitious uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, 45% uh, uh, reductions based on 2001 levels by 2030. Uh, that uh, rolls up into actually the national determined contributions, the, the commitment of the US government to reduce its emissions by 50 to 50. 52% uh, by the year 2030 based on 2005 emissions. So, so we are in line with um, President Biden in terms of reducing our emissions uh, as a foundation. Um, but secondly, you know, what Brittany was saying was really interesting. You know, we, as, as we try to identify more opportunities to drive investment specifically for our, our most vulnerable communities, 
you know, when we look at a HUD projects, Section 8 housing projects, you know, how can we mobilize investment in that sector, uh, given some of the existing challenges with how compensation happens uh, with tenants and, and property owners in that segment? You know, with the goal being to try to reduce the energy burden and give income back to families, we don't want that to offset uh, incentives and other things that those families receive. So maybe there are some opportunities for the federal government to innovate and, and to allow some innovation around the edges so that we can begin to solve the owner tenant problems uh, through state and, and federal partnerships. Um, the third thing, Dewan was mentioning it, the Community Reinvestment Act just comes to my mind. You know, what is the role of the Department of Treasury in uh, broadening uh, qualifying projects and activities to enable mitigation and adaptation projects for climate change to qualify for CRA credits? You know, why not give more credits to uh, entice local banks, regional, state, national banks to put their capital to work uh, in partnership with green banks to drive more investment? Uh, CRA is a great a platform for that. And then just lastly, you know, it's, it's kind of learning from each other. You know, Dewan, as you were talking earlier and you showed that slide on uh, resiliency in Florida, the hurricane windows I think you had and you had water that just had me think about, you know, our vulnerable communities here in the state of Connecticut and what we can do to broaden clean energy, to build in battery storage, to find ways to help our families um, uh, recover faster uh, from the impacts, especially our, our vulnerable communities. So uh, by us talking in this way, uh, we learn from each other and, and to the extent we're learning from each other, we can accelerate these solutions uh, within our respective geographies. And if I can just uh, put some quick comments. I mean, so three things sort of jump out to me from, from the collective comments here. One is um, realizing that most of the kinds of investments and activities we're talking about here are return generating good investments, good credits, but they are also complicated. And that's why these projects very often are not getting built is you need someone with a mission orientation to take the time to actually figure this stuff out, put these deals together with this whole set of partners, public and private, where everybody else wins, everybody else gets to put their money to work, but nobody else is gonna put in the time. And as the New York Green Bank former president often used to say, bang your head against the wall and incur the brain damage to figure out how to do these transactions. That's very much what we're talking about is, figuring out how to put these transactions together. And so that sort of cuts across all of these. From a federal standpoint, I think an important thing here is understanding how this national climate bank uh, policy is very specifically designed to be complementary to existing federal programs. So, you know, we've heard folks talk about LIHEAP and CRA and hosts of other federal programs. This is designed to help bring those together and maximize the impact of them from a coordination standpoint. It's also designed to be able to specifically address smaller and distributed projects that are notoriously hard for sort of traditional federal financing programs like the DOE Loan Program Office or the USDA Rural Utility Service. Very, very hard, near impossible for them to actually address those kinds of projects. And then finally, the targeting. Again, those traditional federal financing programs basically cannot say we're going to invest in this way in these projects over here, but in a completely different way in completely different projects over here. They're just not designed to have that kind of targeting flexibility. And the last category of partnerships, which Juan just touched on, which is really important here, is utilities. They're, the transition to a clean energy future, no matter what your view on the situation is, utilities are a big part of it, and they're going to have to be partners along the way. And so, for example, one key component of the National Climate Bank uh, Act or the accelerator is the accelerator is going to be authorized to engage in direct negotiations with utilities who are in the process of transitioning and closing down a coal plant. And what do you know, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place with a stranded asset cost that either gets eaten by the investors or gets put on to the rate payers. And you know what, usually the rate payers are going to lose that battle. The accelerator can help address some of those rate payer costs and provide the financing to support the transition to a cheaper clean energy solution. And so this is designed very much to have utilities be partners at the table with the accelerator. Um, well, thanks for that. Uh, we are just about at time. Um, and so I'm going to phrase this more as a comment, but allow folks if they have anything that they want to weigh in on. So um, Miguel in particular uh, at ESI, Miguel works very closely along with our colleague, John Michael, with rural utilities to implement on-bill financing programs. And um, I mentioned that in my introduction. And there's a program at USDA called Rural Energy Savings Program. Um, and that's uh, a big driver for on-bill financing. And recently, as of last April, green banks have been eligible to apply. Um, and so I wanted to mention that um, 
uh, Jeff, kind of building on what, what you just were talking about as well, you know, um, on-bill financing provided by rural utilities and cooperatives and municipal electric utilities, things like that. You know, an opportunity perhaps for green banks to develop relationships, productive relationships with utilities, um, and also leverage the mechanics of on-bill financing to reach underserved communities. Um, are there any thoughts on RASP, Rural Energy Savings Program from around the group or um, the potential for on-bill financing um, before we wrap up? Just wanted to say strongly endorse that effort. I think you know a lot of green banks across the country are interested in and use uh, on-bill financing, a key uh, access expanding uh, tool. And sometimes they're complicated to implement. I mean, the existence of your program indicates how hard it is for these to implement because you need that kind of technical assistance to connect the pieces. And so we need to use every tool in the toolkit for sure. I would add that it should not be just rural. You know, I mean, we just need it to be for everything. And it really is at the will of the utilities right now. Like we had the opportunity to work with Martin County Utilities, which were amazing to work with. They, they understood, they saw how beneficial it would be. But I think it's, a, it's something that really needs um, a lot of work. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna leave that to Jeff. <laughs> and the coalition, who, by the way, we got that Lowenstein grant through the Coalition for Green Capital. So it's another example of how, you know, already acting like a, you know, like a, a, a consortium is bringing uh, capital into the green banks locally. So I think we should just uh, note that these collective efforts really, really work. I mean, it's not just talk. We're doing things. I would just add uh, in Connecticut, we have 169 cities and towns. Uh, I believe the USDA thresholds there, Dan, are um, less than 25,000 uh, in population uh, determines your rurality. Um, so that, that applies to about 50% of Connecticut's uh, families and businesses. Uh, and I just say that uh, our application is in. Um, so uh, looking forward to a USDA review uh, and a positive uh, determination. Great. Well, thank you so much. We are at time, and so we do have to wrap. Um, I would, you know, just like to thank Miguel for leading a great Q and A. Thanks to Jeff, Brian, Duan, Brittany for four excellent presentations. Um, I really enjoyed all of your insights and hearing about the work that's being done from the different perspectives. And I, you know, one of our goals for this briefing was to focus on the benefits. Um, and so, to me, that came out loud and clear that you know, if we had such a thing as a national climate bank. Um, the benefits will flow like uh, like we haven't seen yet, which is exactly what we need. Um, and of course, it won't hurt to get emissions reductions on the books either. Um, so thank you so much for taking time out of your busy Tuesdays to join us and our audience. Um, we will go ahead and wrap. Um, in addition to thanking our panelists and thanking Miguel, I would like to thank everyone else at ESI who made today possible. Dan O'Brien, Sydney O'Shaughnessy, uh, John Michael Cross, Amber Tataroff, Anna McGinn, Omri Laporte, also like to thank our four fabulous interns, Anna, uh, Ashlyn, Irina, and Jackson for all their hard work behind the scenes. Um, there's a slide on the screen right now. Um, we would really appreciate anyone in our audience who has two minutes to take our survey. Uh, we read every response. Uh, it means a lot to us when you uh, take the time to fill out the survey. If you had any technical issues, if the live cast wasn't working well, if you have ideas for additional topics, um, we would love to hear everything that you have to say. So um, if you'd be willing to do that, we'd very much appreciate it. Um, lastly, I wanted to just quickly plug, today is a Tuesday. It happens to be the same Tuesday, or it happens to be a Tuesday when we're also releasing our latest issue of Climate Change Solutions, which is our bi-weekly newsletter. If you haven't already subscribed to that, I encourage you to. Uh, you can visit us online at www.esi.org. Also, um, if uh, our briefing archive, everything that you just saw, presentation materials, additional information, all of that is also online. So hopefully uh, you will be able to make that um, a resource for you. Um, and then lastly, uh, before I let everyone go to the rest of their Tuesdays, we have two more briefings in the next two weeks. We have one on Friday uh, about transmission, Friday at noon Eastern. Um, and then we have one next Friday about the grid edge. Um, and that will wrap up our three-part energy system modernization series. So RSVP links um, are available. And of course, if you sign up for the newsletter, you automatically get all that stuff every other Tuesday. Thank you so much to everyone in our audience. Thanks to our four panelists for excellent presentations. Thanks for Miguel for working us through the Q&A. Hope everyone has a great rest of your Tuesday and we will hopefully see you on Friday. Thanks.